So welcome back to our eighth part of our series on teaching empathy to our kids. As before, we are using our favorite book here. So Unselfie by Michelle Borba, which we've gotten to know very well throughout the course of this series. And I'm excited today as we talk about change makers and creating leaders um, with our kids when it comes to empathy. And so I'm actually going to share a story to kind of begin as I've done a few other times throughout the series. So I remember when I was a little kid, and this kind of went through our church, that my parents were really involved with, we call it something like Christmas families or whatever, but it was basically a way of kind of gathering gifts uh, for those at Christmas time who may have had difficulty financially doing so for their kids. And I remember that time, um, I think it's really changed today for various reasons, but we would actually take those gifts to the homes um, where these families lived. And you know, you grow up oftentimes if you're fortunate like me, kind of sheltered in many different ways and, and you're used to being in your own space, not just physical space, but your own head space when you're a younger kid. And I distinctly remember, um, and I can even visualize some of you know, the time spent kind of going into the homes and getting to meet the families and talking with them and having this awareness of kind of looking around and recognizing, huh, so there's a lot of things that we are, we share together, you know, our desires and, and things that we really want. Um, and things about us, but there's some differences here in the way that, you know, these families may be living and things going on there. And I think it was one of my first kind of early experiences to kind of, I would hope, broaden my understanding and, and broaden my empathy to recognize that, again, I'll be very honest, the things I was taking for granted many times in my own life weren't necessarily present for everybody else's life too. And I think that, that you know, I knew it took a lot of looking back a lot of effort on my parents' part, not only to be involved with that, but also to involve me and my siblings there. But I'm appreciative of now of that being the case um, as I've gotten older. And I, and I realize I need to make more of a priority with my own kids in different ways to create early experiences around empathy. So with that story, I'm going to kind of send over to Jamie as we talk about like you know, cultivating the sense of altruism um, throughout their identities and beliefs and the ways that we as parents can really create even empathetic breakthroughs that might not be available unless we really are intentional about it. Yeah, I love that story. I, I was thinking about my own experiences with this. And I remember as a kid hearing, you know, about in, you know, American Girl magazine or teen magazine or whatever, you know, this 16 year old started their own charitable organization. And now they have, you know, $50,000 worth of donations and all this stuff thinking like, oh, that's really cool. That could never be me. Right. Or like, oh, that's cool. They did that in that big city with, you know, all of these other resources that I didn't know of or didn't have. But similarly, um, growing up in a different faith than Dr. Schrader or Jim, um, we had a similar situation as I was becoming a bat mitzvah. I'm Jewish. Um, all bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs were required to um, engage in a service project as part of your kind of culmination of this really, really pivotal moment in our religious life. And um, that was kind of my first experience was like, that was the first time my parents kind of put it in my hands of like, this is your job. You decide how you're going to make this impact. And it's almost similar to like a Boy Scout project as an Eagle Scout. So um I was 13 at the time and did a school supply drive. But one of the, the key things about um, what we're going to talk about today is that for me, unfortunately, maybe uh, this was a one time thing. I did it once. I felt great about it. I knew I made an impact, but I didn't do it again. And I think that I uh, am a pretty empathetic person and I try to be altruistic. But one of the ways that's really key, um, as Jim said, was we can help our kids cultivate this sense of altruism as a core belief and help them, you know, model this idea, talk about we, not me, and things like that in our language. But once they have this identity and these beliefs about themselves that they can and should be empathetic towards others, we want to turn this into action because it's one thing to see yourself as empathetic, but we want our kids to engage in the behaviors that will make them change makers, that will help them engage in the things that align with their beliefs. Um, and so the way she advocates for doing this is, 
is honestly, I feel like I've had this as an adult, but not as a child is what she terms this empathetic breakthrough, which is this kind of like rare spontaneous moment that we can't set up or predict that comes from like repeated exposure of engaging those empathetic muscles, if you will, that at some point we all kind of have this breakthrough where we say, oh my gosh, I need to do something to help this other person because I feel their pain and it's not okay with me anymore. I've reached that breakthrough moment. And when people can connect and feel deeply together, it in- increases the likelihood that kids will act with courage and compassion. And that won't be a one-time service project. It will be an ongoing piece of who they are. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, we are creating our own 501c, <laughs> but more so that that kind of becomes the habit of I'm going to stick my neck out for the kids who don't have what I have. Uh, I saw you were going to say something, Jim. Yeah, I was just thinking about this. There's a really interesting line of research that ties into this about, and you were talking about the kind of cultivating the feeling in our kids that it feels good. I think that's really, really key, right? Because we've mentioned before that we are kind of the people of habits that we generally, generally go towards things that feel good. You know, I mean, even if we're being altruistic, right? And we kind of move away from things that don't. And there's an interesting um, dichotomy that exists when it comes to feeling good. So we, we talk about hedonic well-being where, you know, you have a sense of feeling good about something, right? I may have mentioned this early in the podcast, but it's the sense of like, when I eat an ice cream cone, it feels good, right? Which is great. I mean, that's, you know, we're designed to be able to feel good in various ways that are available. But the difference between hedonic well-being and what we call eudaimonic well-being, with eudaimonic being E-U, it's D-A-I-M-O-N-I-C, I think, is that you don't just feel good, you feel good about yourself. And that's exactly what, you know, Jamie is talking about here is that when you kind of are cultivating and you have this empathetic breakthrough, it's a sense like, well, it wasn't maybe the rush that that blizzard from Dairy Queen was, but like it is, I feel good about what I'm doing. I feel good about myself. And what we find is that those who cultivate that, even at a very young age, are so much more likely to pursue avenues in that way. And not need as much of the other kind in some ways because they can get it um, through helping others. And there's a there's a concept around this. I mean, it's an obvious word, but the concept that was researched in the early 80s is the concept of mattering. So when we believe that we matter to other people, like Jamie, you mentioned about your experience, we are much more inclined to take that similar route again, right? But when you don't feel like you matter to other people, well, actually at the very opposite end, this is where, again, I think it serves us to be empathetic. But the opposite is it's often where we even feel depressed and hopeless and everything else. So empathy, which creates a sense of mattering to other people, is not only protective just in general from a social standpoint, but also from a psychological standpoint, too. And I think that's really important there. Yeah. And I think you're speaking, too, to this idea of like self-esteem and that there's lots of different ways we can potentially build self-esteem, right? Like it feels really good when someone tells you, you did a good job. And when you feel like you're doing a good job at whatever it is, you feel better about yourself. But when we as parents and leaders in our communities can kind of say, we get just as much self-esteem from helping others as we do from being the number one academic student in our grade or the best basketball player in the school, then we see that like, yes, being a great basketball player is great. And I don't ever want a kid to feel bad about that. But when we see all these extra kind of benefits from the social piece of helping others as being a key piece of our self-esteem, then we can take that into the other areas of our life. And what we know is that giving, this idea of giving without receiving back that altruistic component leads to healthier, happier, less stressed kids. Mm -hmm. And that across the lifespan, regular volunteering has been shown to improve outcomes, including years lived. And this idea of mattering, I think, um, when I think of that, I think about research that I've learned in terms of geriatric populations. Mm -hmm. And we think about lifespan development and this idea of like, okay, when people retire, they go to volunteer and that's where they receive kind of their meaningfulness after they're done working. And I'm like, well, what if we can instill that in kids who are like five and six years old? And then they don't necessarily always have to be a workaholic who works 80 hours in order to feel like they are a good person or they are contributing something in that, hey, I work 40 hours like Dr. Schrader. I leave my computer at work and I go home and I can do other things to help myself really feel good about the contributions I'm making. So I think that it just kind of expands our understanding of what it means to be 
contributing and to matter, not just to yourself, but you're mattering to other people too. Yeah. And I think, you know, the key we're making the link here is it's one thing to teach something. It's another thing to actually put it in action. Right. And that's the link that we have to kind of bridge with our kids and not that, not that the teaching component isn't really important and not that that's something that wouldn't carry on lifelong to some extent, but when you bridge that and they see that you're making that effort um, and, and it might be in a real simple way. Like we had, it was really neat. We had recently someone that sideswiped our mailbox. Um, they were coming around the corner and they weren't hurt or whatever, but it kind of basically tore our mailbox from out um, where it was at in our front yard. And one of our neighborhood kids um, saw that came over and he, you could tell like he was cleaning up our yard. He was cleaning up the driveway. Like he was really concerned. Like he was doing all these things. And honestly, you could sense this like feeling good about himself that he was able to kind of help and intervene and do things for us beyond, of course, what he was asked to do. And you, when you see that rise up, you know, and that was an opportunity that just kind of sprung up there. Um, you recognize, oh yeah, like our kids again can feel good and enjoy life by giving to others. And I agree with you said, Jamie, I mean, there's a lot of ways to give, you know, when you're a start athlete and I think that's another platform in and of itself, but um, how cool would it be if we continue to cultivate this idea that you could feel great and give and like make connections with other people and all in the same process? That's a really cool idea. Yeah. And I think kind of going off of this idea of the athlete or the academic, it's really kind of culminating here. All of the things we've talked about over the past several weeks in that, again, what we emphasize as parents can really show our kids what's important and what we value. So if we're, um, one of the things in this chapter that stood out to me, and I've heard, I know Jim's heard this too from kids. I always ask kids when I see them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the amount of kids who tell me they want to be a YouTuber is shocking. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not that old, but YouTube was not a thing when I was a kid. Um, I wanted to be a teacher my whole life. And this is a real shift that we've seen in this Gen Z Zoomer generation is this idea that being famous is something that every kid can be, not just the select star, the best singer in your school. And while I want kids to be what they want to be. I would never tell a kid you can't do something. At the same time, if we're surrounding our kids with influences of people who are famous for famous's sake, who are YouTube toy reviewers making billions of dollars every year, how many of those do we really need? And how self-building is that for our kids to see another kid um, in a me, me, me type of way, in a materialistic world and things like that, when I think when we want to raise change makers, we want to say it's you, it's, it's us, not you. And one of the things we can do is really emphasize to our kids and surround them with the models of adults and other people who do engage in the change making behavior. And there's two reasons why I think this is especially timely right now. So polls over the last 80 years have consistently shown a gradual move to more of like extrinsic rewards, extrinsic focus. You're talking about like being famous or having status or whatever um, versus more civic mindedness. We've seen that like migration over for a lot of our youth and young adults. Um, and that carries a price. You know, there's a lot of things that come with that that may not necessarily be positive. The other thing is we're actually seeing a lot of labor shortages um, and helping professions. So if you look across yeah. like the medical profession or even other professions that are much more active in nature, even like engineering, things like that, that are not online based as much in that way, we're seeing um, increased rates of like difficulty recruiting. And so I, I think that Jamie, without going too far um, on, in this vein, our society really kind of comes to depend a lot that yeah. we, we get something positive out of doing something for other people, because oftentimes it's the career, right? Like, you know, those who are, I, I love all of our mechanics that we worked with over the years for a car, because I have no skills. And if, if there wasn't someone out there who found a sense of purpose and a sense of ability in fixing cars, well, I would, we would have a really rough time. Right. And so, yep. um, and I think you, you, your point earlier is a great one. We are quick and I'm, I'm guilty of this for sure. We're kind of quick to glorify and pay a lot of attention to those who excel in those, you know, famous ways. But how much do we teach our kids? Like, wow, like how amazing is it that someone can figure out a car engine uh, and really understand that area? Like that's, that's a really remarkable skill. We should really celebrate 
all the different ways that people give of themselves um, uniquely and, and very importantly that I don't think we often do. Yeah. And I think it's really hard. I, this is not a podcast about capitalism, but it's something that comes up greatly in my conversations with you, Jim, and just understanding our social world. And I think it, it bears just acknowledging, right? We can't change it. We're not going to be the people who all of a sudden say, Hey, let's give the teachers more than the YouTuber, right? That's not us who we decide. But when we live in a materialistic world, it's not saying everybody needs to grow up in poverty or everybody should not have what they can in order to survive, but rather that there's something about being humble and understanding that no matter what you have materially, you always have what's in yourself to give and share. And that that is what can create contentment and gratitude more so than having the things that people need or yeah, want, sorry. And, and you said something and this just catalyzed something in my mind, I think was so key. So all this, this entire series, we've been teaching about how empathy really is not only good for society, but good for our kids' health, right? And what we're kind of teaching is that empathy creates a sense of ability and capacity and understanding that is the opposite of fragility, right? We're, we're trying to create a sense with our kids of not feeling fragile in a way that um, oftentimes doesn't happens in you know, different domains. But I want to be very clear. There's a difference between fragility and vulnerability. And vulnerability in many ways is a good thing. And I, I mean this in a positive way. Like when you're empathetic, you're acknowledging like my own own vulnerabilities. My, you know, I'm I'm creating, you know, and helping our kids understand that being vulnerable around the right people and being willing to acknowledge the challenges and see the challenges that others and themselves have is a real connection point, right? So while we're not, we don't want our kids to be fragile, we do need them to be vulnerable um, to a, an appropriate extent within their relationships, right? And I think that like you're describing there, there's just this intersection of like creating a sense of altruism and empathetic responding so that when it's someone else is struggling, I'm not so like confident in my ways that I can't feel that struggle to some extent. Right. You know, right. In the same vein, we're not so fragile that we can't respond. Right. And the response is needed there. So. And if you're interested for those listening in more really fascinating information and research about vulnerability, Brene Brown is a PhD in social worker, and you've probably heard her name. Her book on vulnerability is amazing. And truly, I think it's great. And what I want to go off of here is this idea of vulnerability versus ego mm -hmm. and how there's so much research about the growth mindset um, as it relates to what you're saying here, Dr. Schrader, or Jim, I don't know why I'm on a Dr. Schrader today, um, which is this idea that if we can show our kids that it's not about being the best, it's about being better than you were yesterday, and that being the best is relevant, relative and almost irrelevant because you never know if you're the actual best. It's the best for you, and it's better than you were yesterday, and the things that matter. I know I'm not the best, you know, pre- uh, I'm not the best postdoctoral fellow, but I'm doing better than I was yesterday. And I think you and I both know I'm doing better than I was last year. And that's what matters is this idea of like, if you practice, you will get better at all of these different things. And we're all going to make mistakes sometimes. It's not about being perfect or the best, but this idea of like always wanting to do better in the things that really matter in that creating that is what is healthy, that growth mindset. We know when you are in a fixed mindset, psychologically, there's very little that um, positively can change for you until you can see the growth mindset as a, as a way to live. Which is a lot about humility in the same vein, right? Jamie? <laughs> when right. You think about but I don't have everything. I don't know everything. <laughs> That's a hard one for all of us here, but like humility yeah. says, I need a growth mindset. It's really good. It opens up lots of opportunities. Like if I, you know, keep myself away from everything that's wrong, you know, like going wrong or not doing well, then how am I going to connect with others and how am I going to grow? And so humility certainly intersects a lot. So as we're kind of getting in the last 10 minutes, I want to think about this. Um, there's an acronym called FACE here that she uses. And I thought that'd be kind of fun to, to talk to our audience about what this or how this relates to empathetic breakthroughs. So I love this idea because as I was reading through it again, refreshing myself, I thought this is everything we've done. This is all of the things we've talked about is how can we use all the skills, these nine habits to actually be empathetic because we've talked about emotions and problem solving and self-regulation and action, but 
what do they actually mean when they come together for this behavior of empathy and, and doing the, the thing? And so this acronym of FACE is really key in that area. So these are all four things that you've all learned how to do with your kids. You've, you've started to think about how can you do these things? So F, feelings. Read the person's feelings. Use your feeling identification skills. That person looks distressed. That person looks sad. I'm feeling sad because somebody hurt me or I am having an emotional reaction. We have to use those feelings identification skills. That's the core. That's the base of the pyramid. And then we have A, analyze. Use those problem-solving skills to figure out what the problem is. Is it a communication problem? Is it a resources problem? Is it that, you know, some kids don't have what I have problem? What's the problem? Brainstorm. This is where that problem-solving, get all the ideas out on the table, and then you can really think about and analyze the problem together. And then the next one is C, which stands for care. And what's really interesting about this piece of the puzzle is that you're, you're, the care part is I ask that person, what do they need help? Do you want something? But this is really where we're using that self-regulation piece, because a lot of the time when we see someone in distress, it makes us distressed because socially that's what humans do. And it's important when you are faced with a situation where you want to help that you're able to regulate your own emotions because you become too fragile, too affected by the situation, and you become unable to help in a way that's effective. So I think that self-regulation piece of coming at it from a, hey, I noticed it looks like you're feeling sad. I think the problem might be that you're confused about my what I said, or it seems like I miscommunicated. Can I help you? Or what can I do to make this better? Or what can I do to make this right? Without getting too upset or angry or sad yourself. And then this last piece, E, is empathize. This is where you use all of those pieces. You say, you look sad. I notice this is the problem. Do you need help? They say yes. And you say, I can't imagine what it feels like to feel, you know, how sad you are. Or I can't imagine being in your situation and, and I'm going to help you. And all of those things coming together allow you to be authentic and transparent, maybe in your own ignorance of the situation, but also to say that regardless of that, you do want to do something to help. You want to change and be altruistic and empathetic in that situation. Now, I wanted to add something to the C, the care, because this is a really important point. I think sometimes when people hear about, you know, creating empathy with others and with our kids, they get the sense that like, well, then are we creating kids so emotionally connected that they've got to feel exactly what the other person feels, right? That like, if the other person is kind of in a basket case and is really, really upset, that to truly be empathetic means you've got to try to be there with them in that same emotional state. And that's really not true at all. It, it, the sense is that, you know, you strive to understand where they're coming from, but I think you're, that was a really big key is that if you're so upset and you're so emotional that you really can't, you know, and aren't regulated enough to be able to think through what to do, what's possible, what's going on, then it isn't necessarily the best place to be. Again, there's nothing wrong. I mean, we as human beings, sometimes we're, going to be overwhelmed. That's not what we're talking about. But like when we're cultivating the sense of empathy, it's to say, you know, respond to the person and their needs and what you're hearing and seeing and feeling. But like, you don't have to be necessarily like if they're crying, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to cry with them to be empathetic. Right. I think that's, that's an important point because depending on your temperament, depending on your demeanor and your own experiences, you may show more or less emotion, but all of us and this is the active step, right? All of us can take steps to understand the situation better for what it is, understand that person's context. And then in our in a somewhat regulated state, say, hey, I, you know, maybe this is an option, right? Maybe this is what we can do. So exactly. And so one of the biggest ways, so like we've given you all these strategies, we've talked about like, okay, here's how this looks, and here's the great benefits of it. But I think the biggest thing is what we want to try with kids who are as young as three, four, five years old is to help them see and have those breakthrough moments where they're really having the opportunity to experience a situation where they can exercise those empathy muscles because we know the more they practice, the better they'll get and the more of a habit it will become. So it's really key to find something that's meaningful and connected for your family and your children. So 
your child loves sports. They want to be the best basketball player. That's great. We don't want to discourage that, but maybe there's a way that they can work with, you know, the boys and girls club or the YMCA to, you know, do a sports drive or help find coaches for teams that don't have coaches or whatever the passion is for them. So my thing has always been education, school supply drive, all of those things that really tie in together that I can say, this is meaningful to me because it's something that I'm very interested in. It helps get your kids buy-in and, and more motivated. Um, and that's a great time in those family meetings to say, hey guys, it's a new month. Whose cause are we going to work on this month? Or how can we make sure that, you know, dad is able to participate or those kinds of things to get everybody on board. It can't just be one kid one time. Um, and making a plan that really includes your kids' ideas, helping them take ownership and not helicopter parenting the empathy, right? Like, what do you want to do? How, you know, model that problem solving? How can we solve this problem? You noticed that one of your kids at school doesn't have boots for winter. How can we solve this problem, right? I, I can tell it made you sad and I want to help you solve it. Um, and then the other big thing is that direct contact. It's one thing to say, we're gonna donate our allowance to charity in December, or it's one thing to say, you know, a lot of families take portions of their income and donate to their local church or, you know, charitable organizations, and that's great. But it's another thing to have that person-to-person -person connection. I am helping you because I want to help you because I know you need it. And I'm doing it for nothing other than to say, I know it's helpful. Um, so I think that direct contact of multiple instances where your child gets the exposure to those situations is really the bread and butter of being able to practice those space skills and build the habit of this does feel really good when I help somebody else. So as we close out the last few minutes, just a few things that kind of sprung to mind about this, everything that we say ultimately from us as parents requires of us to have the energy, right, to do it. And I think that, you know, we we're talking about having grace with the busyness of life and, and you know, there, there are often little ways to do great things. And I think that that's a great place to start with this whole idea is you don't have to have, like you said, a 501c3 or whatever, uh, little ways can do, you know, great things. Uh, but I do think it, it speaks to Jamie, the importance of, I, there's an article on my website, james-schrader.com about the three E's of parenting, which are energy, empathy, not surprising, and emotional regulation. And anything that we can do as parents to cultivate that within ourselves means that we're more likely to be able to pursue the kinds of things that we're talking about here. But I wanted to share one last story. My Recently, my son and I, Noah, um, is, he's interested in training for his first half marathon after seeing his younger or older brother do it a couple of years ago. And when we go out for our runs together, um, I always, we kind of talk about the very beginning. All right, Noah, so who are we going to dedicate this run to today? Like who, who do you think would love to be out here able to run that might not be able to, or just, you know, there's a reason why it's difficult for them. And while that is not necessarily taking empathy to an action standpoint in the way we described today, what it is doing is I think it's just a tiny little opportunity to say, hey, while you're doing something that you really want to do and something that's meaningful to you, let's dedicate this to somebody who may not have that same opportunity. And my hope, Jamie, I don't, I don't know this. We'll see how it plays out. My hope in the, is that in little ways, those ideas kind of find themselves into the fabric of our kids' lives as they grow up. And they start to recognize that we, we truly are blessed in lots of ways by other people and by what we have. And giving back is, is just not only wonderful, but I think something that we all should consider. So, so I love I'll, that. I yep. do. I think, I, I think, yeah, I could have a lot of thoughts, but I'll just say, I think that's a great place to start and just the things we say and how we say them. Yeah. So if you're a parent out there listening and you think, oh gosh, like, where do I have the time to fit in this idea of volunteering before you ever even fit anything in, consider the things you do every day as part of your life. And consider how we can begin to and continue to instill a sense of we, not me. So on that note, we're going to let you guys go for this week and look forward to seeing you back as we get ready to wrap up our series very soon. So hope everybody has a great week. Thank you. Thanks, guys.